Good morning. We're glad to have you with us. Thank you for joining us again at Emmanuel Baptist Church, Emmanuel Online. And uh, we'd love to have you visit us, to join us. If you haven't been able to come yet, we, we miss you so much and we look forward to seeing you again. So we're having great times together, services and God's Word. It is an amazing thing. It truly is an amazing thing just to encounter the, the grace of God, the gospel of, of Jesus Christ. To look at the cross and to pray, Lord, just give me fresh eyes. Help me to see what you did for me in a fresh way. God, help it to just touch my heart once again this morning and today. God, God, help it to remind me that everything I do, Lord, I do it because of you. I do it for you. We just get a picture of Christ that's beyond comprehension and beyond words. How can we even fully understand what Jesus Christ did for us and why he did it and what he was willing to, to pay because he loved us so much? We are seeing all of that here in John. Last week, we saw Jesus Christ delivered up to be crucified in chapter 19 of the Gospel of John. This morning, we're continuing that. We're going to the cross today. We have to remember Matthew chapter 20 and other places. Jesus Christ, as he's taking the disciples, he's moving towards Jerusalem. He prophesies. He says, the Son of Man will be delivered to be content, condemned, to be mocked, to be flogged, to be crucified. He's taught that the Old Testament required that that would be the price for the Messiah to come, to give salvation, to give life, to become King of kings and Lord of lords uh, for Israel, for the world. It was, it was a step of obedience that our Lord freely embraced. So Jesus Christ has been telling his disciples clearly up front, this is what's going to take place. But they've, they've had great difficulty in grasping and understanding what it really means. As Jesus came out of the garden of Gethsemane, he came out with this commitment. Lord, it is your will. Lord, I'm, I'm committed to your will. That is, that is his desire for all of us who are children of God, that we would be committed to the will of God in everything that we do. That was the Lord's commitment. It drove him forward. John chapter 17 and many other places also remind us that what drove him simply was the glory of his Father, the glory of God that God would be glorified in everything that he did, how he did it, why he did it. And so Jesus was committed to that. He stayed the course. He went to the cross because he was committed to the will of God and the, and the glory of God. It was a great cost on Jesus. Jesus paid the highest cost. He gave the very highest sacrifice that could be given. He gave the only sacrifice that could be given to satisfy the wrath of God against the sin of humanity. And he took our place. There was a great cost to him and he was willing to bear that. He was willing to take that. As we, as we looked at that last week, we were just reminded Jesus Christ was, was brutalized. Chapter 19. He was rejected he was condemned. His, his back was flogged. His skin was laid bare. It was raw. It was bleeding everywhere. His muscles, his bones. Many times that punishment alone would bring death to a man. Even before they made it to execution, Jesus Christ would be flogged and then he would be executed. He was rejected by Israel. He was rejected by Pilate, by Herod, by his people. They did not believe that he was the Messiah, the promised one. He was condemned. He was condemned to die. And so I want to pick it up today here in verse 16 of chapter 19. We'll read the text and then we'll come back and we'll, and we'll look at the, it this morning. <clears throat> John chapter 19, verse 16. And so, and so Pilate, he delivered him over to them, to the Jews, to be crucified. And so they took Jesus and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. And so they think it was named that because it probably looked like a skull or there was, or it was just a place where there were skulls that were remains after the crucifixions were over and the executions were over. We don't know for sure. And there they crucified him and with him two others on either side and Jesus between them and Matthew and Mark and Luke have a lot more to say about these two, two criminals. 
Pilate also wrote an inscription. He put it on the cross, and it read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of Kings. And many of the Jews read this inscription. For the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic and in Latin and in Greek. And Aramaic was was the language of, of, of the region. Latin was the official language of Rome, of the soldiers, and, and Greek was really the language of the people. And so the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am the king of the Jews. They didn't want that. They didn't want to affirm that he was the king. They rejected that. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. He was, he was angry at them. He had been cornered into a decision he couldn't move. He had no place to maneuver. And he was mocking them at every turn now and twisting the knife in them as a nation and as leaders at every turn. This was his way of doing that. But he didn't know also he was honoring Jesus Christ. That wasn't his intent. But it's true. He is the King of Kings. <clears throat> and, what those, and when the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and they divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, and also his tunic. So there's four soldiers who have the, the ultimate responsibility of this crucifixion. They divide his, his garments. But the tunic was seam, seamless. The tunic would be the uh, undergarment. It's woven in one piece from top to bottom. And so they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. And this was to fulfill the scripture, which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. And so the soldiers did these things, dividing the sandals and maybe the belt that he wore and the outer garment and the other various things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus saw his mother and the disciples whom he loved standing nearby, or the disciple whom he loved, he said to his mother, Mother, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. And after this, Jesus, knowing that all now was finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch. They held it to his mouth. And when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is Finished, And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. He gave up his spirit. We just see the example of Jesus Christ here, of him being God, of him going to the cross and taking our place. He was brutalized. He was rejected. He was condemned. But not only that, he was alone. He was alone. We see here in this text in... In verse 16, 17, and he went out bearing his own cross. He buried his own cross. He carried his own cross. We see also down at the end of this chapter, we just finished it, in verse 30, when he received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. Only he could complete the course. Only he could go to the cross. Only he could stand in our place. Only he could give his life for us. Yes, we see from the other gospel that uh, there was a man named Simon from Cyrene who was, who was compelled by Rome, who actually was forced by Roman soldiers to carry the cross of Jesus. It's most likely that he couldn't carry it just simply because of, the, of the, his back being flayed, his back being whipped, scourged, and beaten, a lack of strength. But we're not, that's not totally sure. It simply might have been somehow that they just wanted to, to mock and humiliate another person. We don't know that for sure. Because the scripture doesn't, doesn't specifically tell us why this man was given. But it's most likely simply that Jesus Christ was beyond strength in the moment of having gone through all of this intense persecution and flogging and being hit and, and, uh, and all the things that took place. Jesus Christ was alone. He accepted that. There was no one else that could pay the cost that he could pay. There was no one else that could go to the cross. 
as the God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit from eternity past, as they, as they laid out this plan, Jesus willingly laid Himself and said before God, says, I will be the one. And as they planned from eternity past, in God's perfect will, it was determined that Jesus Christ would be the one. And He willingly accepted that. And He was alone in those years. His years on earth, He had many that were surrounded Him, and many who loved Him, and many who were His disciples, and many who would turn to Him in faith. But at the end of the day, He was alone. He was the only one who carried a burden that only He could understand. No one else could understand the weight of sin that He would carry. No one else could understand the weight of obedience that He carried. No one else could understand the weight of the calling that was His. No one else. He had to bear that alone. He had to carry that alone. No one else could do that. Jesus willingly did that. You know, when we are called by, by Christ to carry those burdens, He understands. He was alone. Not only that, He accepted the uh, being the fulfillment of God's Word. As this plan from eternity past was laid out, Scripture was written and Scripture was laid before us and there was a plan that was laid by God. And Jesus was willing to accept fulfilling all of those details and all of those plans. That was His willingness. You know, in verse 23 and 24 and 25, when, when they took His garments, but they didn't tear His garments, they cast them for lots, and it's fulfilled here in verse uh, 24. We see that in Psalm 22, verse 18. They divided my garments among them, for my clothing they cast into lots. Uh, they didn't tear it. That was the fulfilling of, of Scripture. He willingly put himself in this place to fulfill God's Word. That's what he did. Not only that, verse 28. And Jesus, knowing all that was now, knowing that all was now finished, said, To fulfill the Scripture, I thirst. He put himself in that place. He willingly carried out every intimate, specific detail of the prophecy of God's Word. He willingly, faithfully carried that out. What God asked him to do, what his Father asked him to do, he willingly did that. We are called to follow God's Word perfectly as he did, to honor his Word in our life just as he did. Not only that, he accepted being the, the agent of God's love, being the being the conduit of God's love to the very end, being the only one. He is the source of God's love. He is the, the origin of true love. He is the one who, who gives us and extends to us the love of God because of what He did on the cross. Because we see that perfectly here as He's on the cross in verse 26, when Jesus saw His mother, and there's the crowd there and the soldiers before Him and the family and friends are probably back a little ways. They're held back, and then he sees his mother. And when he sees his mother, he extends love out to his, to his mother. And he says to John, John being the disciple whom he loved, and Jesus is the oldest of the other half-brothers and sisters. He is, the, he is the oldest, the elder. And so he takes control here, and he's, and he's with love, looks to his mother, and he takes care of the needs of his mother. It's interesting he didn't give the care of his mother to his brothers or sisters. Because we're not told yet at this point that his brothers or sisters have, have trusted him, have given their lives to him, that they have faith that he is the Savior of the world. We're not told that. They're going to respond in faith. After he rises from the dead, he gives, he gives the care of his mother to John. He loves his mother to the very end. That's what he does. You know, John 13 just reminds us, here that having loved, he loved to the very end. Not just the disciples, but us, his mother, everyone who was who was of faith and who was a part of the family of God. He faithfully loved them. You know what? He loves you and I. As he calls us to a, to a path, he loves us to the very end. He loves us completely. This morning, he loves you so much. And he will love you completely. And he will love you in every circumstance and in every moment. He will be faithful to do that because he was faithful here to love not only his mother and and his disciples, but all who followed him, all who were out of this world who were called to him. That is key. Let's take a let's just take a brief look and just put some pieces together, just so we have the pieces. From from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we can fill out the spots. He was stripped of his royal robe. And then his clothes were put back on him after they took the robe off. His garments were put back on. Si Simon of Cyrene was forced to carry the cross. He was just, he was just in for the, 
for uh, what was going on that weekend, the, the Passover feast, most likely. Uh, um, and so the soldiers saw him and they forced him. He didn't choose. He didn't volunteer. He didn't want to do that. He was forced to do that. Jesus was offered a, a drink of myrrh. It was a narcotic. It was to dull the senses. It was to dull the pain. He refused it. He would go to the cross with his senses fully intact. He refused this drink. He prophesied. He prophesied of coming judgment. He stopped and he talked to the woman who they were weeping. He says, don't weep for me. He says, weep for Israel. He says, judgment is coming to them. Weep for Israel, not for me. They were broken over the sight of their of their Savior, of their Master, of their Rabbi going to the cross, bleeding, having been flogged and beaten and shredded. He says, don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves. Weep for Israel. He wept over unbelief. He still weeps over unbelief. He calls them to weep over unbelief. His garments were divided among the soldiers. We see the reaction of the people, of the criminals, of the Jewish leaders. We see that in, in real color in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The criminals both mock him when, they, when he's on the cross initially, and they, they hurl insults at him along with the crowd. And the disciples weep, but the other people, they hurl those, those mocks and insults. And then we see in Luke that one of those criminals turns to, by faith and, and receives Jesus Christ as Savior, trusts in Jesus Christ. Everything about that criminal changes in that moment. Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus says, Today you will be with me in paradise. He says that to this criminal who will who has put his trust and faith in him, whose life is transformed right there on the cross. There is a time of darkness, three hours of darkness we see in the Gospels. Jesus also says this, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. These are, these are other elements that come into play from the Gospels. And so we see that. We see the example of Christ. We see what he was willing to pay. What was he willing to accept unto himself so that he might be our sacrifice, our savior, our provider, our advocate? The question is, what does that mean for us? Well, it means this, that we are, when we receive Jesus Christ, we are called by faith into a relationship with him. What does the death of Jesus Christ mean for us? Well, it means salvation. It means relationship with the Father through Christ. It means that we can have life transformed, that what is dead can become alive. It means that we can ultimately have the assurance and the hope of heaven. But it also means much more. It means much more. Mark chapter 8, verse 34. It, it means this. Jesus is speaking to the crowd before he's going to go to Jerusalem. And he says... He calls the crowd to him with his disciples, and he says to them, If anyone would come after me, so this is the call. He says, Come after me. Come to me. Come after me. He calls the crowd to himself. He calls the crowd to faith. He calls the crowd to relationship. He calls the crowd into, into a life of change. It's very significant. What is it that he's calling every believer to? This isn't just to the disciples. It's not just to the crowd then and there. It's to every believer who calls upon the name of the Lord. When we are saved, we step into this relationship. We have chosen to come after Christ. We have chosen to embrace Jesus Christ. We have chosen to say, Lord, you are my Savior. So the question is, what does that mean? Well, it means this. Very, very clearly the Lord teaches. Here are some things that we need to understand in our relationship with Jesus Christ. Here are things that we need to understand as we come to faith in Jesus Christ. It's interesting that verse 8, 34, he calls the crowd to him. The crowd, are, is, the crowd is not made up of all believers. The crowd is made up of unbelievers. The crowd is made up of those who have received Christ. The crowd is made up of these disciples and, and the larger group of disciples. He is still calling people to himself. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He is still extending that. He is still... He is still calling to them to, to receive him as Savior in faith to come to him. But as he extends that call, hear what he says to those who would hear and to those who have already received him as Savior. He says to step into relationship with Jesus Christ, to accept the call of Jesus Christ, is to deny ourselves. He says if anyone would come after me, we must deny ourselves. We must, we must accept this that life is no longer about me. 
when I become a child of God, everything, everything that was important to me, the values, what drove me in my life, what were the highest goals in my life, I now submit to Christ. I release them to Christ. My goals change. Now all of those goals are submitted to Christ. And so I say, Lord, if it's your will, I will do this. Lord, if it's your will, I will do this. Lord, if this goal, if this path is not pleasing to your name and to your testimony, to your plan for my life, I will gladly set it aside. I have to deny myself. Life is not about me anymore. Only the Spirit of God can change the heart of man. Only the Spirit of God can change your heart this morning. Within your heart right now as you listen, within my heart right now as I preach, is a, is a propensity to think about myself first. That sin nature is still within me. It, is not, it does not control me anymore because the Spirit of God lives within me. A child of God who is in relationship with Christ, the, the sin nature does not control us, but it influences us every single day and every moment. It is a constant battle. But in Christ, we have the ability to say no. We have the ability to yield and to submit to the Spirit of God, to the Word of God, to honor Him, to please Him, to do His will. We have the power in Christ to do that. Jesus says if you're going to be a child of God, you must deny yourself. You must accept this, that when we step into a relationship, it's not about us anymore. It's not about me anymore. We yield that. We say, Lord, change, change my change." My, my sin nature that wants to make life about me and change it so that my spiritual nature overrides that and my goal becomes my life is about you, Christ. It is about you. It is for you. I'm called to deny myself. I'm called to be focused on Him. I'm, I'm called to take up my cross, not only to deny myself, but to take up my cross. When I take up my cross, I'm accepting, the, I'm accepting the path of God's choosing for me. The cross is His cross. The cross is His calling in your life. When He saves us, when the Lord Jesus Christ saves a child of God, when we step into a relationship, He has a specific path for my life and for your life. He has a cross that He will choose for us to bear. He has a cost that He says to every one of us, this is what, this is what you will accept as a child of God, to walk and to grow, to be conformed to the image of Christ, to bring honor to me, to bring glory to me. You will walk as I walked. You will understand that this world is an alien world. You will understand that to love Christ is to hate the world. You will understand that the world will hate you, will not honor you, will not want anything to do with you on many occasions, that the world will make your life difficult, that other believers may make your life difficult. You are called to live for me. You were called to take up the cross. There will be hardship because of, because of my name stamped on your heart, on your life. It's not going to be easy. We are called here to take up our cross. See, Jesus Christ, He willingly went to the cross. Never, never, never forget that Jesus Christ took up His cross for you and for me. He took up our cross. He took our burdens, our weight, our sin. Our cross now is the obligation, is the duty of the call of Christ in our life. Our cross is the impact of what that means. Our cross is a world responding to Jesus Christ in our life. Our cross is not, not the burdens that we have because we make life miserable for other people. Our cross is not the sin nature that, that reveals itself in our life. That's not the cross. The cross is the purpose and the plan of God being carried out in my life. Our cross is, is walking in obedience to Jesus Christ. Our cross is doing it for Christ, the way Christ would have us to do, with a heart that honors Christ. Our cross is, is showing the love and the grace of God to a, to a lost world. Our cross is being light in a dark world. And when that light is revealed, the darkness will flee, will hate us. We're to take up our cross. Or to say, God, whatever your path is for me, I, I accept it. Not only is that true, not only are we called to deny ourselves, to take up our cross, we're called to follow Him. He says, we're, he says, I am to deny myself, I am to take up my cross, and I am to follow Christ. The goal is this. The goal of a relationship is, is Christ-centered living. The only way that I stay on that course is to keep my eyes focused on Christ. The path of blessing, the path of wisdom, 
the path of understanding, the path of righteousness is keeping my eyes focused on Christ. If you want to be a blessing and an honor and a testimony to Jesus Christ, to this world for Christ, if you want others to see Christ, if you truly want people to see Christ in your life, there will be a cost in your life. You and I are called to give up the things that would normally pull us away. We're called to let go of those enticements that draw us off of this path of commitment to Christ. We're called to keep our eyes focused on Christ. Deny ourselves. Take up our cross, His cross, and to follow Him. To get on the path, to stay on that path, and every day say, Lord, today is Your day. Lord, today I will follow You. Lord, as I lay my calendar and my schedule and my plan out, as I lay my phone out and I look at, I look at all the things, as I lay, it, lay out what I need to do, how I'm going to respond to people and relationships, what I'm going to write on social media, what I'm going to post, how I'm going to re react, my goals for today, God, all of those things, may they be in your name, may they be honoring to you, may they have an impact of drawing people to Christ. Now, you are in charge of whether they receive whether they trust you in faith, whether they respond in faith, but I want them to see Christ through my life. That's what this is all about. Lord, whatever the cost is of walking for Jesus Christ, of loving Jesus Christ, whatever the cost is of receiving such a great love into my life and then living on that love, I'm willing to embrace that cost. I am willing, Lord. He says in Mark chapter 8, verse 35, the next verse, whoever would save his life will lose it. If I, if I am will, unwilling to let go, to believe Him, I will lose my life. I will be separated from Christ for all eternity. Whoever loses his life will save it. When I come to the cross, I, I give up control of my life. I say, Lord, it's not my life anymore. It's yours. Have your way and have control. When I lose my life, when I give my life to Him, when I, when I give it over to Him, when I sign my life over to Jesus Christ, and I allow Him to put His stamp on my heart for all eternity, this is what I'm saying. God, my life is for You. And God, my life is for the sake of the gospel. My life is for you forever now. For the rest of my life, it is for you. That is my goal. And my life is for the gospel. Jesus makes this very, very clear. Whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Do you understand that? Do you hear that? If we're not willing to, to embrace the cost, whatever that might be, as he embraced the cost for us, he says, you're not worthy of me. He also says that we cannot be his disciple. If we were not willing to, in relationship, embrace the cross, to wholeheartedly come after him, he says to us, this is not my words this morning to you. These are his words. We are not his disciple. We're not a child of God. Let me encourage you here. That's a strong warning. And we need to hear it. We need to accept it. We need to embrace it. But let me encourage you as well. If you're listening this morning and you know Jesus Christ as Savior, there is finally this enablement of Jesus Christ that's true in our life. We have the cost of relationship. We have the call of Christ in our life. Now we have the enablement of Christ in our life. The cost is to follow after Him. The call is to follow after Him. The cost is, is willing to let it go and to receive blessings innumerable blessings eternal blessings unable to put into words that are richer than than anything we ever would give up paul says i count i count as loss everything else in my life that i might gain the immeasurable riches of christ the relationship of christ my gain is what i have in christ everything else is loss but you know what? We can't do this on our own. It would be so discouraging to listen to what I just shared and say, I can't do that. And to feel like we've got to do that on our own. But you know what? We're not alone. Galatians 2.20 reminds us, I have been crucified with Christ. With Christ. I have been crucified. He's going to tell us what that means. This is a familiar verse to you, I know, but I'm going to break it down. We're going to look at it. Whatever we do, we do it in relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, how encouraging that is. Now let's be reminded, as Jesus came out of that garden, it was His will. He was committed to the will of God. He knows that we're weak. He says, right now as you listen this morning, you may be there saying, you know what, this is my passion, this is my desire, but I'm, I just don't know how this is going to take place. Maybe you've said this over and over again, you know what, this is my will, this is my passion, and we find ourselves stepping back again. We find ourselves falling back again. 
You know what? The key here is prayer. The key is what Jesus Christ did. It's what he called the disciples to do in the garden. It's to pray. We must watch. We must be alert in our life. We must look for those things that sidetrack us, that pull us away. That's being alert. That's watching. And we do that as we pray. And we just lay those things before the Lord. And we lay the glory of the Lord before our eyes. And we pursue him. We watch and we pray. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And this is what I accept. This is what I remember. You know what? When I look at Jesus Christ, I, I am just reminded that I am walking with Him. I'm walking with Him, not alone. You're not alone this morning. You are not alone. If you're, if you're listening to this and, and you've never received Jesus Christ as Savior, this, this is, these are hard sayings. Yet the gospel is the most beautiful thing in the world. The cross is the most beautiful thing in the world. It is, it is an expression of God's love and grace. It is mercy to you and I that, that our sins and our scars can be washed and cleansed and forgiven. He calls us to a path that is not an easy path. It is an exceedingly difficult path. But we are reminded here that we're never alone. You see, he gives us a burden, a yoke, but that, he says that yoke is easy because it's tailor-made for each one of us. And he walks with us as we, as we walk this path. And he carries that burden with us. And He gives us the strength to follow His will and to obey from our heart. And He gives us the ability. He transforms and, and conforms our heart to His. He makes it possible. And He gives us the desire. So it's not just us pulling up our bootstraps and working as hard as we can. How discouraging that would be. No, He helps us. He enables us. He empowers us. He changes us. So this is what we want to do. Boy, that's beautiful. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. He lives in me. By the Spirit of God, He dwells in my heart permanently. He can never be removed. His character by the Spirit of God is infused into my heart. And the more I follow this course, the more His character becomes my character. And I, and I love Him and desire to follow after Him. And I embrace it. And, I, and I, with each passing day, I see more and more the blessing and the riches of obedience. I see more and more the blessing and the riches of, of accepting the cost of following Jesus Christ because the goal and the rewards and the blessings in the end become greater and greater and brighter and brighter. And the blessings each day of the Spirit of God and the Word of God being poured into my life, it becomes stronger and greater. I'm not alone. And he says this, And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. See, not only do I... Do I walk with Him? Christ walks with me, but my hope in Him, my hope is in Him. You know, my eyes are forward. When I'm discouraged about what's going on here and now, when I strive to do the right thing for Jesus Christ, and there's a cost, the greatest thing that I can do and that you can do is just keep our eyes on Christ. Because I walk by faith. And I believe Him. When I walk by faith, I say, Lord, I believe You. I trust You. I trust that we, what you are asking me to do, it's going to be worth it all. It's going to be worth it. Every step is going to be worthwhile. Every hardship is worthwhile. Every command, every opportunity, God, everything, whatever it is, it's going to be worthwhile. It's going to be worth it all. The riches of eternal relationship with Jesus Christ, we cannot even comprehend how that will make whatever is hardship now, whatever the cost is now, it will make it like nothing. Can you believe that? Do you believe that? That one day when we are with the Lord, whatever hardship we have faced, whatever turmoil we have faced because of our relationship with Jesus Christ, God will reward us, bless us because of that. And then the fruit of eternal reward will be so rich, it'll, it'll make whatever hardship we have here seem like it was nothing. But it doesn't seem that way now. So we need to keep our eyes on Christ. My hope is in Him. We're crucified with Christ. We don't... Because why? I live by faith because He loved me and He gave Himself for me. You know, the greatest encouragement is this, is God loves you. He loves you. He would never, ever ask you to take a step that He hasn't taken Himself. He would never ask you and I to take a step where He hasn't gone before us first. The Scriptures teach that. Whatever step, whatever hardship, whatever cost He asks us to pay... He's already gone before us. And what He's laid before us in that next step, 
is every resource, every blessing, every enablement for that step. He says, I will give you what all that you need. I will give you faith. I will give you strength. And I will extend peace. And I will extend boldness and courage and witness opportunity. And I will extend to you everything that you need. He loves us so much. He loves us so much. He died for us. He took our place on the cross. The gospel is a hard gospel. I'm saying to you this morning, it's a hard gospel. Yet it's the most simple thing in the world. When I trust Jesus Christ as Savior, when I confess my sin, when I confess the dirt of my life, He washes me. And He transforms me. And the minute He does that, He places His Spirit in my life. The Word of God begins to take effect in my life. The character of Christ begins to be infused into my life. And I want this path. And I want this course. And I see the cost of walking with Jesus Christ as an opportunity to bring test glory to Christ, to be a witness for Christ. And I embrace it. And the riches of walking with Christ grow stronger every day peace of God and the love of God and the joy of God grows in my heart. Remember John wrote these words. These are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that by believing you might have life. You know what? This path of hardship is life because it's filled with the riches and blessings of Christ. It's filled with the hope of eternity. It's filled with the promise that one day all of these hardships are going to be behind us. In eternity when we are with Him there will never be hardship again. Not one ever, of any kind, never, ever, it'll be behind us. Is it not worth it all to walk with Jesus Christ now, whatever the cost, to receive that hope and that future and that blessing? I trust you know Jesus Christ is your Savior this morning. If not, I call you to faith in Him. I call you to receive Him as Savior. It is the richest most life-changing decision you will ever make. It will be filled with blessings beyond a measure. But it will involve a life where you are now called to Jesus Christ. And the Lord will expect you to walk with Him. And He will enable you to do that. May the Spirit of God touch your heart so that you see it is worth it all to take that step of faith. Lord, we trust You this morning. We love You this morning. You are the greatest in this world. You would never ask us to accept any hardship where you weren't first willing to do that yourself. Chapter 19 of, of John just shows us what Jesus Christ was willing to do because He loved me this morning. To everyone who is listening now, He loved you so much that he, he took your place. There is no hardship that we could ever face it would be worse than the wrath of God against sin. And the wrath of God was poured out on Christ because of our sin. And He took that wrath and He transformed the wrath of God into a relationship of love. Who wouldn't want a Savior like that? By Your Spirit, call us into relationship this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name, Amen. May the Lord bless you and may He take this Word and continue to use it in your heart this morning and this week. Thank you for joining with us.